first trip to the planetarium, probably with your third grade class, more excited to leave school than actually learn anything about science, you know who you were, you find your seat, impatiently waiting for the show to start, ignoring the withering look of your teacher, and then, Incredible. How can we be so small, but so special? That is, I believe how the wise men must have felt. These magi got quite the star show themselves, except it was just one star. One bright, magnificent, piercing, brilliant ball of fire. And boy, did they bet a lot on that star. But just like the one they were traveling to see, this star stood out as something special. This one beckoned Follow me, and what a payoff. When they arrived in Bethlehem, they asked, where is the one born king of the Jews? We saw his star when it rose, and we've come to worship him. And it got me thinking, is worship a little different the harder the journey to get there? Struggling along the road with others, the type of trip that tests your faith and breaks your back? What's that worship like? I can't speak for the wise men. Maybe they shouted hallelujah, or they knelt in quiet reverence. We've all walked our own difficult journeys. And when we got to the other side, we all felt it. The joy we had to fight for tasted just a bit sweeter. And for that bright morning star, the one that caught you in awe when you saw it, well, What else can you do but rejoice when you realize that the journey was always leading you to Jesus? What a powerful thought. Is worship a little different the harder the journey to get there? Struggling along the road with others, the type of trip that, trip that tests your faith and breaks your back. But I like that last line that he says, The journey was always leading you to Jesus. There is a wonder of joy in waiting, waiting to be experienced this Christmas. When you realize, or maybe are reminded of, that road that you've been traveling on, all the ups and, and the downs in life, the, Delights and the struggles, and all the pleasures and, and the disappointments, they've all intersect with the Savior who was born for you. And maybe what we need to be reminded of the most, the more difficult the journey, the greater the joy will be when we come to the realization that Jesus is worthy to be pursued he is worthy of all that we have to offer to him. The wise men's journey to see the promised Messiah it was a long and a, it was a very difficult journey. It cost them time. It cost them resources. But ultimately, their difficult journey was worth it and allowed them to come face to face with the newborn king. After many miles of searching and persistence, the star in the night sky guided the, them to the Savior who was born in the stall. We find the, the story of this in Matthew 2, 1 through 12. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem 
And they asked, where is the one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw the star when it rose, and we have come to worship him. When King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. When he called together all the chiefs, people's chief priests and teachers of the law, he asked them where the Messiah was to be born. In Bethlehem in Judea, they replied. For this is what the prophet has written. But you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will shepherd my people, Israel. Then Herod called the Magi secretly and found out from them the exact time the star, star had appeared. He sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and search carefully for this child. As soon as you find him, report to me, so that I too may go and worship him. After they had heard the king, they went on their way. And the star that they had seen when it rose went ahead of them until it stopped over the place where the child was. And don't miss this verse. When they saw the star, they were overjoyed. Continuing to verse 11. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. Then they opened their treasures and presented him the gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their country by another route. As the wise men returned to their country by another route, I can't help but think that like the shepherds told everyone that they met about this wondrous thing that had happened, that these wise men couldn't help but to be in their overjoy share with everyone they met, they met of this wondrous thing that had happened. They set out with a purpose. They saw a great light, a star in the sky. It led them with a purpose to see the newborn king, and they found him, this baby, lying in a manger, not in a castle, but in a cattle stall. Scriptures are clear. You were created on purpose, for a purpose. And part of that purpose was to experience the wonder of joy, a life-changing relationship with Jesus. At just the right time on your journey through life, the events of life, they align in just the right manner and they point you to the one whose birth we celebrate this time of year. Jesus, at just the right time. Regardless of where you've been in your journey or how you have arrived here where you're at today, God has a history of using different, sometimes difficult situations, people, and circumstances at just the right time to help us see the light, to remind us of the light. And that light is Jesus. God has a way of helping to give the right direction to our path, shining his light into the darkness, the difficulties, the chaos, all of the messiness we talked about two Sabbaths ago, that those dark things that come with that messiness. And he reveals himself. He's light. Right when we need him most. On April 14th, 1865, Abraham Lincoln, the 16th president of the United States, was assassinated by John Wilkes Booth. Lincoln was the, the first U.S. president to be assassinated. Civil War was 
toward the end of it, but was still going on. It was a dark and it was a messy time in our nation's history. President Lincoln's assassination was part of a larger conspiracy intended by Booth to revitalize, to re-energize, to uh, give a boost to the Confederate cause by eliminating the three most important officials of the United States government. Two other conspirators were also assigned to, to kill Secretary of State William H. Seward, and another one was assigned to kill Vice President Andrew Johnson. Except for Lincoln's death, the plot had failed. Seward was only wounded, and Johnson's would-be attacker, to get the courage up to do it, got so drunk that he could not follow through with killing Vice President. Now, you might be wondering, what does Lincoln's assassination have to do with Christmas? <laughs> I am so glad you asked. <laughs> According to Dr. Ray Pritchard, who is Ray Pritchard, this, uh, he's the president of an organization that's called Keep Believing Ministries. It's an internet-based ministry that serves Christians in 225 different countries. But according to him, the news of Lincoln's death deeply troubled a young minister at that time in Philadelphia. That young minister's name was Phillips Brooks. When President Lincoln's body lay in state at the Independence Hall in Philadelphia, Brooks went to pay his respects there. But it affected him, and he was in a dark place because of it. And Pritchard, he writes about about that situation this way. A few months later, hoping to lift his spirits, the church sent this young pastor to the Holy Lands. The itinerary included a horseback ride from Jerusalem to Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. Later that evening, that young minister, Phillips Brooks, uh, spent some time in the field where, according to tradition, the shepherds heard the announcement of Christ's birth. Then he finished up the day by attending a Christmas Eve service at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. Phillips Brooks was deeply touched by this experience in the Holy Land. Three years later, he wrote a Christmas poem that reflected how much he was touched. Louis Redner was the church organist, and he composed a melody to accompany Brooks' poem. The result is the beloved Christmas carol that begins this way. O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. By thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars, they go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. Out of a dark, deep, messy time period came a beautiful expression of faith. The everlasting light, the hopes and fears of all the years are met in thee tonight. About that same time, in Germany, another favorite carol was being composed. It first appeared in a small Lutheran book of worship. Shortly after that, sometime after that, someone wrote the name of Martin Luther on the bottom of the page. This led uh, many people to think that Martin Luther composed this hymn. There was a problem, though. Martin Luther had died 200 years prior to that. So it made it a little bit impossible that he wrote that. Still, it is a beautiful expression of faith. And it begins like this. Away in the manger, no crib for a bed, the little Lord Jesus lay down, his sweet head. 
The stars in the sky looked down where he lay. The little Lord Jesus asleep in the hay. But that's not the end of the story, as Paul Harvey would say, the rest of the story. During that same time period, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow found himself in a state of deep, dark depression. It was Christmas Day. The Longfellow was having a very difficult time mustering up any Christmas cheer. He wasn't feeling the joy. Not only was our nation involved in the bloody Civil War, but his wife had died in a, a couple years earlier in a house fire. In fact, he was, tried to rescue her and was burnt badly him, himself. But on top of that, his son had joined the Union Army without his consent, and he was severely wounded in the war. Understandably, Longfellow was a, in a very dark place, was nearly at his wit's end. Yet, it was this day, Christmas Day, when we celebrate the coming of a light shining in the darkness, the heavenly light that the shepherds saw, the light that, that formed into a star that the wise men saw, the light of God's word that leads us to God's gift of light. On that Christmas day, Longfellow wrote these words. I heard the bells on Christmas day, their old familiar carols play. In mild and sweet, their songs repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Can you identify with that? We hear the stories of Christmas. We know the nativity story. The old familiar carols they play. And how just sweet and peaceful they are. Peace on earth, goodwill to men. But then the next stanza says, and in deep despair, I bowed my head. There is no peace on earth, I said, for hate is strong and it mocks the song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. The dark events of the Civil War and life events that he was, had a strange stranglehold on Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's mental state. It's in this state, in experience, in this deep, dark rejection, that he was reminded. Listen to the next stanza by Longfellow. Then rang the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail and the right prevail with peace on earth and goodwill to men. Now think about it. Our nation is engaged in the Civil War, brother against brother, neighbor against neighbor. And yet out of that dark, turbulent time, the Spirit of God, shining into the darkness, led these three men to write music that will forever remind us of the light of his word, the light of his love. And what does that do? That gives us hope. That gives us joy. And for some time of year, for this time of year, it leads us to that. That joy, that unexplainable joy that we can experience even in the dark, uncertain times that we may be in. How great our joy. What was the young man again? What did he say? We'll go back to that. Is worship a little different? The harder the journey to get there? Is worship a little different? The harder the journey is to get there? Struggling along the road with others? 
<coughs> excuse me, struggling along the road with others, the type of trip that tests your faith. It almost breaks your back. It bends you low. Isaiah, one of the prophecies that we look at at this time of year is Isaiah 9, 2, and verses 6 and 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. Verse 6, for us, to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Verse 7, of the greatness of his government and the peace that will be no end, He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Excuse me. And the zeal of the Lord, the zeal, the passion, the enthusiasm, energy, the zeal of the Lord, God Almighty, will accomplish this. Did you just feel that? Did you just feel that little leap in your heart? That is called joy. That is called hope. That is what we receive as we celebrate Christmas, as we celebrate the birth of our Savior. No matter how dark, let me repeat that, no matter how dark the night, no matter how dark the situations are that you find yourself in, God's promised light, Emmanuel, will be and is with us. This is the promise that the angel gave to Joseph in Matthew 1.23. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which is God with us. This is also a repeat of a prophecy back in Isaiah, I think it's chapter 9. But this is one of the great prophecies that we hear all the time, but especially this time of year when we celebrate Jesus' birth and his being named Emmanuel, God with us. Especially we need to be reminded of this in our deep darkness, in the messy times. Okay, I hear you. I've heard this before, but this darkness that I'm going through right now, it is so dark. I I just need to be reminded that this really is true. Because God with us, well, I'm not really feeling that at the moment. Isn't that the question that Satan tempted Adam and Eve with? Is it true? Did God really say? I understand. We've all been there, right? Darkness can be so dark that sometimes making the perfect, it makes the perfect opportunity for Satan to try to get us to, to question, is it true? Is God really with us? Is God really with me? Can it really be true? I've asked myself this question many times in my past, and God always answers that question by reminding me of his gift of light. His gift of light that shines into 
And as John 1 puts it, dispels the darkness, eliminates, overcomes, breaks up that darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. How does God remind me? How does God remind us of his light, of this promise that he has given us, of his presence with us? Number one is through his word, the light. And secondly, through his people. That is you and that is me. This is why there is no substitute for good Christian fellowship. Interaction between other believers. Because it is in that interaction and sharing God's light that has shown on our individual lives and it's broke up that darkness. And as we share that, it encourages each other that are experiencing that darkness to be drawn to that light. His light is the light of the world. He's the light of my world, light of your world. The angel told the shepherds that night so long ago, tells us again every time that we are reminded of this story, that they saw a great light, and that light drew them into action to go, to go and see, and to worship. And the result was is they could not contain the joy that all of a sudden broke that darkness that they were in. And they couldn't help but share it with everyone they met. The wise men were drawn to the light, a star, a new star in the sky of many stars that was so bright that it stood out from all the rest. And that star drew them into action, and they pursued that light. And when they found it in that manger, they worshipped it. As verse 10, remember, told us, they saw the star, and they were overjoyed. Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians for God who said, let light, be, let light shine out of darkness, made his light shine in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of God's glory displayed in the face of Christ. The shepherds saw that that night. The wise men saw it when they visited. And you have seen it in your life too. You just need to be reminded of it. Again, Emmanuel, God with you. So this is a reminder. The wonder of Christmas and the joy that is found in Jesus is also waiting to be illuminated through you, through your life story, to those around you. Father, we uh, thank you for this light. Father, so many times we don't uh, let it shine. Sometimes we uh, let the darkness just kind of seep in. But Father, we're told in your scripture that it cannot overcome your light. Father, I pray that this morning, this time of year when we celebrate the birth of our Savior, Father, that it'll be a reminder of the promise that you have given us, the promise that you have led us with so many times in the past, just that reminder that once again, you are calling to lead us out of that darkness again, that you want to be the light to our path, 
to show us the way to live our lives in worship to you. In Jesus' name, amen.